Welcome to the Creator Spotlight, the interview portion of the Spotlight right here on Fightful. I am Steven Jensen, as always, joined by Jeremy Lambert. And our guest today is the Chief Brand Officer of Jazzwares. He's an investor. He's a collector. He's a legend of the fig game. And he's also Logan Paul's Pokemon guy. We had a lot to talk about today. <laughs> Jeremy Fidauer is joining us. Jeremy, how you doing, man? Thanks for joining. What's going on? I'm so happy to be here with you guys. The, the, I'm here with the real Jeremy, Mr. Lambert, and Steven oh. Jensen, the legend himself. So this is good. This is good times. <laughs> oh, man. Thanks for Already off the bit. bat with the brownie points. I yeah. appreciate it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us. I, Jen, this is a Steven Jensen special right here. You see all the figures lined up behind, uh, behind him. And uh, uh, I was collecting figures when I was very young. And we were talking a little bit off air. I have, I have kids now. And they have no interest in the wrestling figure stuff. But they're like, the Squishmallows and Roblox guy? That's who you're talking to? This is this is what we're interested in. You mean this? You mean the yes, Squishmallows? They, they, that's, that's a giant one, one too. Look that's at that a big thing. one. Yeah, Man, chocolate dipped <laughs> strawberry Squishmallow right next to me. <laughs> well, just to start off, I mean, it just – because we're so there's so much we can talk about. Swishfellow is right there. I mean, y'all have the IP for like massive stuff. I mean, Pokemon, Fortnite, Roblox, AEW. Um, the Squishmallows, though, similar to Jeremy, there's a girl that I know that has like a little nephew, like uh, he's probably like five, six years old. Once again, no interest in like in wrestling, but the Squishmallows are huge. And I've been seeing them in like the malls and stuff. Uh, what's it been like with like that taking off and Jazzwares in general? Because y'all are still like a fairly new company, but like well, guys yeah. with a lot of experience, you know, obviously doing this together. Oh, man, it's been it's been a great five year run. That's for sure. So Jazzwares is the fourth largest toy company now, which is uh, remarkable. But uh, the, the path to get here was an entrepreneurial path. So uh, about 11 years ago, myself and, and, and a couple partners started a business. Uh, eight years ago, uh, Jazzwares and a private equity firm acquired us and combined us. And right after we were acquired, we bought Squishmallows together. We bought a company that owned Squishmallows together. And it has just been a rocket ship. Um, sometimes entrepreneurship is really hard. And it takes a long time to grow and to become viable. And I, I remember someone who had had success in business tell me, you just need to have a break followed by a bigger break. And I was like, damn, I can't even get the first. Where's the first break? <laughs> but it's amazing. You know, it's amazing. A, a lot of resilience and things tend to come together. A few things came together. And, and, and yeah, Squishmallows has been uh, absolutely phenomenal. It's been a phenomenon what about just like you in general like getting into this world and becoming who you become like you know I mean, jeremy Fidauer is a name that you know if you collect really any of these things we're talking about you're you're, you're even once again in, in the even in like the hype beast youtube world if you go and you watch logan paul buying pokemon cards you can see jeremy Fidauer right there i mean um was this because i know you're obviously like you're a big collector yourself you're yeah. an, but on top of that, like you're an investor, you're into like the graded stuff, like you're really deep into this world. NFTs, like really everything collect collectibles. Is that really how it's always been for you? Is like you yeah. were always a big fan of this and just became like your life and your job and everything? Yeah. So I grew up in the deep south. I didn't have connections. Grew up in a very middle class family, not a kid that had like a college fund lined up for me or anything like that. But from day one, I was collecting. Uh, my brother's 13 years older than me. Uh, that my parents were teenagers when they had him. And uh, basically he heavily influenced me when I was a kid. He just, he took me to flea markets. He took me to uh, places where I could, you know, buy things for a buck and then, you know, see things being sold for three bucks down, down the way. So from the earliest time, whether it was coins or stamps or baseball cards or whatever it was, I was always excited and into collecting. So for me, it was natural uh, as I got older to always resonate towards it. And uh, when I was in college, I started creating a series of websites and gamed Yahoo. So Yahoo, the search engine, was a super dumb algorithm. It was simply, if you had two letters that started with A, you would show up first on their search. So I created a series of websites called Absolute Beanie Babies, Absolute Furby, Absolute This, Absolute That. And after a few weeks, I had thousands of people coming and streaming through. So that was the very first opportunity in my early 20s to, to really monetize my love and joy for collecting uh, as a business person. And I followed that trail. I, I, I finished grad school, went to Mattel, went to another company called Jax, and then started Wicked Cool Toys, which ultimately became Jazzwares. And it's just been a 
that is the fastest summary of my career and we can deep dive <laughs> into that. But man, well, it's been a lifelong, as you said, it's been a lifelong pursuit. There's no doubt. Where, where does wrestling mix into this? Like as like a fan and as a collector and as someone who makes these things. Because also, I mean, people have to know this. You mentioned Jax. I mean, the classic superstars line is like one of the most iconic. I mean, you're involved Thanks. in so much that's like, because I mean, if, for, for people who are in the know, the AEW figures very much feel like an extension of that line. And like, it's yeah. something that I think collectors were, miss, were missing for a long time. So I was 29 years old and I was at Mattel. And uh, I got recruited to go to Jack Specific to head up their boys entertainment group. And 29 to head up a division is quite good. But one of the reasons why I was an ideal candidate is that I had toy brand management experience and I was a big wrestling fan. And a big wrestling fan because I moved eight times by the time I was 13 all over the South. So it's a perfect marriage when you live in the South, especially Mississippi, Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, all those areas that I lived in. Wrestling over indexes and permeates, especially regional wrestling, because why you don't have Major League Baseball. You don't have the NFL, but you have these bigger than life, super heroic personalities that would come through town and establish themselves as the professional athlete of the area, not just a professional athlete. The professional actor, the professional stunt person, the professional athlete, the professional everything. So I'm 29 years old now, and I had this life, you know, I had this childhood with wrestling, and I had toy experience, and I had a little bit of internet experience doing stuff. Got recruited to, to Jax. And, you know, one thing at the time is that it was about two and a half years after the Attitude Era. It was 2002, 2003. And the toys were treated as toys up until that time, up until I jumped in the wrestling game. It was all about who's the latest guys and can we put a cool feature in there? And is there a way that we can sell to kids? During the Attitude Era, things as you can imagine were blowing up. But a few years past the Attitude Era, things had simmered way down. In fact, sales of toys were so far down that we were about to get pulled off the shelf at Walmart and Target was really questioning whether they wanted to be in the wrestling game at all. Um, those were the two biggest players at the time. Toys R Us was always committed, but they were taking very small business, and so was KB. So 29, big fan of wrestling, and I said, you know what? I have an idea. Why? Because I was a baseball card collector, a card collector growing up, and I loved the old alumni. I loved the superstars of yesterday. So I believed if we treated the toy business like a collector business, that we could actually – create a significantly larger uh, opportunity, despite the fact that the ratings may be lower. So I had the opportunity to sit in front of Vince McMahon. And I said, uh, Mr. McMahon, 29 years old. Uh, I said, uh, I we're having challenges in the toy business. I was like, but I have an idea. All right. Tell me the idea. Let's hear it. You know, let's see. Let's hear it right now. And I told him, I said, it, it involves bringing back the alumni in, in, and I have an I idea for a name called Classic Superstars. And I showed him the first wave and the first wave included Ultimate Warrior, included Bret Hart, included people that were not traditionally in the entertainment. And when Mr. McMahon says that if it's good for business, he'll do it, he actually means it. Because no matter what was going on between those guys, he actually green lighted it. So as long as I could go and sign these characters, we could do the deal. And, uh, it, you know, it began from there in 2003. Wow. Not, were there, go ahead, Jeremy. So were there challenges? Because as you kind of mentioned, yeah. it's like Ultimate Warrior, Bret Hart, weren't on the best of terms with WWE at that time. So were there challenges like getting them to, to <laughs> sign anything here? It was, it's amazing. You know, one thing I can say about toys is that toys are like the great calibrator of adults and other human beings in general. You bring toys into a situation and you can solve a lot of the world's problems. I I'm convinced. I'm convinced because you're so emotionally attached to your childhood and you're so emotionally at attached and you want the best thing for children, right? I barely meet anybody in this world who don't want good things to happen to kids, okay? The worst of the worst in business, still, if you give them a button to push, they're going to push. Yes, we want good things to happen to children. Okay, they don't maybe they don't care about adults so much, but that's just the truth. So, 
sitting with Mr. McMahon and talking about the classic superstars line and in the concept of saving the business and the concept of growing the collector business, but at the same time, m making there be a place for kids to go to retail and find WWE and wrestling figures. That was, a, that was compelling for him. Here was the challenge. And what, and what he, what he, you know, posed to me was simply that, listen, if, and, you know, he said to me in his own voice, if, you know, if WWE ever wants to do an alumni association, which is, you know, today, as you can see, they really do leverage the alumni a lot and, you know, under the legends deals. But if they ever wanted to do it, how could they let me go rogue and sign individuals? OK, so that was the first challenge. And luckily, I had enough legal knowledge and background to say, how about this? What if we sign them? We pay them a minimum guarantee. And we make it a non-exclusive so that they're not locked into us and only us forever. But B, if you sign them, we lose the rights, but they're fully paid by us, but we gain the rights from you because you're the licensor. So that solved the problem with WWE. WWE looked at it and, and, and Vince McMahon very specifically deemed that to be a appropriate solution. But then on the flip side, the question is, how do you get Ultimate Warrior and Bret Hart and all those guys on board. And the way we did it was simply making some phone calls. And uh, it was a lot of fun finding agents and finding family members and finding all the folks. And look, when you're 29, it's amazing how much energy you have. I mean, I'm, I'm almost, I'll be 50 in a couple months. And I will tell you, my energy level is much lower. My experience level is a lot higher. And, uh, but pho phoning in 100 phone calls to professional wrestlers is not like number one on my list right now. But at the time, it was awesome. It was like the only thing I wanted to do. So calling Ultimate Warrior, befriending him, and assuring him that, you know, A, there is an open playing field here, no matter what's happening from a legal standpoint, no matter what's happening from a conflict-oriented standpoint, and then doing a deal with him that was creative because he was a very good business person. And what Warrior said to me was, look, I'll do it, but I want you to make me some very limited edition exclusive mm -hmm. figures that I can individually sell. And those have become legendary in and of yeah. themselves. Bret Hart was just, it, it was an easy, it was very easy, just a phone call, uh, understanding and explaining the situation. And, and he signed on. And most of these guys did fascinating, fascinating group of individuals. These guys, speaking, unbelievable. Speaking of that ultimate warrior, is that one that you, Kyle Peterson has one of those from you, right? Is that is that one of those? I know he has he has a he has a figure that has like a, like a letter next to it from you, like authenticating it. And I don't know <laughs> if it's that one that you're talking about. Well, yes. Yeah, so what happened was we did several limited edition warriors. One we did a couple we did for New York Toy Fair, and that was really to kind of introduce the idea of classic superstars. And the buyers would come in, and then we did a special event for guys that had like. Uh, it was pre podcast. So maybe they were writing for a magazine or maybe they had a newspaper, but, but we were like handing these out and people were like, their minds were like melting. You could see like their brains seeping out of their ears. They were just like blowing up in my, and I, I was just like, this is incredible. But yeah, that, that's how though. So that was one of a hundred there, but yes, warrior, we did it several one of fives and maybe a one of 10 for him. And, you know, he would sell them for thousands of dollars each course it didn't cost us very much i mean we just created the sample and of course it was fully approved by wwe and everybody was on the same page nothing was done under the cover of darkness everything was totally ethical and and uh if i sign something saying something was authentic it's it's authentic that's sure. that's my take on it absolutely you, you're you know who i'm speaking of when i bring up kyle peterson you know yes you're, you're, okay okay he's, he's, he's a youtuber that like i watch this stuff all the time and he's he's always bringing up the the pinless joints on the AEW figures he, he never yeah. shuts up about the pinless joints i never even knew what those i never even knew what that was until he kept bringing it up i was like what what even and then i'm like this isn't even a big deal like this isn't like a big deal at all um can, can you speak on that by the way just because i'm thinking about it like is that because they don't the supremes don't have them right or yes. they have but they have the pinless and the others have the pins right here, I've got a Supreme yeah. right here. So go. I've got a Ray Phoenix Supreme. And if you look at the joints, uh, what you'll see is there's no, there's really no pen whatsoever. Okay. Right. And if you look at the joints of a traditional AEW figure, um, I guess it just depends on which one. Honestly. Yeah, you can't even see. 
Yeah, you can't even see it. <laughs> you always bring it up. I yeah. know. That's uh, all right. Listen, I, passion is the best part of this. And it's what's yeah. so exciting to me about the entire wrestling figure game is that there's a community within a community here. And people are as passionate about the wrestling figure business as they are about the wrestling business. Um, and and for me, it's been great because it's it's turned me into the niche of the niche of the niche known in a particular area, which has been fascinating and awesome. I've loved it. Well, I think I, I think the first time I ever heard your name spoken was through um, Cardona and Myers. Like it was, yeah. like, it was those guys. Like they were you know, talking about you a lot, especially around the time that the AEW figures were being uh, like conceived. Um, yeah. Speaking of you know, kind of the challenges and in, in, in putting together everything for classic superstars. What's it like, I guess, in comparison, like if it's similar or like way different doing like jazz wears with AEW. And then on top of that, like, is there the opportunity similar to what you were just talking about, where if there was like a performer not signed to AEW that wasn't signed anywhere, like, is there some potential yeah. there to, to do like AEW jazz wear style figures for them as well? Yeah. So first I just want to say uh, Cardona, Myers, those guys, they've brought so much legitimacy to collecting uh, and it's been something that I think the entire community has benefited from their hard work. You know, you can have people work on the video game side and they get all, they get heralded with all kinds of positivity. You have somebody doing something on the action figure side and, you know, for a while there, it was considered a little bit more nerdy or a little bit more niche. And I think, I think they changed the entire perception of that. You know, uh, the, the, the whole idea of the 40 year old virgin, uh you know from from back in the day that's done that's over comic-con went from being niche to being mainstream and beyond mainstream it's like you have to be there now if you're trying to sell something meaningful so we're really i mean for me from the bottom of my heart those two guys and smart mark and 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 all those guys uh mean a mean a world to this community and mean a lot to me personally um now that means that I've completely forgotten the second. Oh part. no, sorry. No, no, I'm glad that I'm. Thank you for saying all that though, because they're to be honest, like watching those guys, because initially they were doing their show on like the WWE YouTube channel before they had been released, and then they brought the whole thing over with like their their shoot names. And around that time, I remember, like. I was in this position where I was like trading in a lot of my old stuff that I didn't need anymore. Well, they got even action figures, just like stuff around. And I started going to these places that had like old figures. And I started thinking like, Hmm, I really, I used to collect the Bendoms. Like I'm starting to find some of these that I'm seeing around. And I used to collect these and that. And um, and so I started getting into it and I started seeing Cardona and Myers and like their videos and this whole community around it and stuff. And it was, that that was for me too, is that that was a big thing of getting me really deep back into it. Um, Yeah. The second part of my question was about the relationship with jazz wears and AEW yes. and like the, and if, if it's possible to go outside of AEW to bring talent in that's on sign for, for the figure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, so there are t- two parts. So when we did this with WWE 20 years ago, it was a very novel idea. Uh, in fact, it had never been done before uh, really. I mean, maybe on very small scale and certainly Mr. McMahon had never, approved anything like that but the timing was perfect and there needed to be a catalyst within the business to drive it okay uh 20 years later it's interesting because it is a proven pattern of business and um so there are more uh alumni that are signed to deals um i think AEW would be fine and very much open with us doing this but I still think that we're still driving the basic concept of AEW as a brand within wrestling uh, and making sure that that in and of itself is situated well at retail. And we came out of the gates on fire and we've been doing quite well uh, and we manage retail very closely. So even like I'll give you one in September, we're literally going to go into retail, remove old figures from the shelf and replace them with new figures. And you know what? That's extremely unusual for a, for a manufacturer to do that. Usually they just let retail choke on something for a while, but like we believe in AEW and we want to keep that. We want to keep variety at retail and we want to keep this thing flowing. So to answer your question, yes, I do think it's viable. 
it's different now than it used to be because it's much the cat's out of the bag, let's just say. So it's a little bit more nuanced and maybe a little bit more difficult to put together a program that's viable, but it can be done. And I think AEW would be totally up for it. And most importantly, uh, we just want the AEW figures themselves and the talent within AEW to just have a nice, easy flow at retail, which you, you, we've had and you're going to see, uh, especially going into the fall. I want to ask about the uh, LJN deals because when yeah. this came out, everybody was very excited when the AEW LJN figures came out. So how did that partnership come about? And then the, the second part to this is how do you decide which wrestlers actually get the LJN figures? You know, we're just, we're doing very few of those, right? So it's like every other wave and then it comes out in, in, uh, in uh, the, uh, the unmatched uh, wave. Um, uh yeah, look, it's it's one of those things that we tend to focus only on the very, very top of the card talent for LJN style figures. And so you're, you know, likely going to see maybe the top 15 uh, pro wrestlers uh, within AEW get one over the course of time. Um, but we're opening up an e-commerce uh, business as well. And so it does give us more leeway to sell more and go deeper into the roster, even on the LJN figures. And so there is that opportunity. Uh, the LJN brand, interestingly enough, was owned by Chalkline. Uh, and those guys are super awesome to work with. So we reached out, we did a deal, and, uh, and, that's, and that's how the LJN and some of the wrestling buddies came about too. Can, can you speak at all? Not that you probably don't want to, honestly, but like the Darby LJN, the whole yeah. kind of debacle with that. Because I own the figure. I was looking forward to it for a long time, but it was that was that was just a strange situation, it felt like with the delay on that. Yeah, I mean, I think in general there there was I'm trying to remember what was the specific delay on Darby. Was it the was it the size of his of where how he was positioned? He didn't fit in the box. That was a speculation that I was seeing. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fair. So I've my mindset was I wanted all the LJN figures to be the exact same size as the original LJN figures. Okay. And I was pushing the factory really hard on that. Uh, the first figure that came out, the Cody, um, wasn't of the same scale as the original LJN. There was a bit of a miscommunication internally. They did everything they could to live up to what I wanted. But in doing that, it, it, it was weird and it just simply didn't fit. And we learned one very important lesson, and that is once you choose a uh, footprint at retail, and what I mean by that is once you choose a box size, um, you can't have one box that's outside of the range of that box size, or it screws up the entire planogram at retail. Mm -hmm. And so that that's really the basis for that. And uh, I, you know, I'll take accountability on that one. I think it was a scenario where I was pushing really hard. Everybody wanted to... to do do everyone wanted to deliver to what I was saying. And then at the end of the day they did, but then the box doesn't fit. And it's just, uh, you know, not, not my best moment, but it's definitely one of those things that um, I think you, you use that as a lesson and move forward and do it the right way next time. Well, I appreciate you like giving an answer on that. Cause you know, it was, it was just like a weird scenario for, as fans. Cause like we were all waiting for it to come out and then like yeah. it didn't come out and then, but Hey, but I, I have it. It's sitting in my display. I got my whole wall of exclusives over here next to me. So it's all good. <laughs> Um, good. <laughs> yeah. So, Hey, and um, I, I forgot to ask you this when I, when I just brought up about the po possibility of unsigned talent with like the relationship of new Japan and AEW and forbidden yeah. door and the crossovers, like, yes, is there going to be new Japan figures or can you talk about that at all? Uh, if I could talk very freely about it, I would. Um, it's, it's a little bit outside of my domain to give or speculate specifically. I mean, let's put it this way. I'm going to talk, less as an action figure manufacturer and i'm just going to talk more as a, a fan for a moment and say all of the things that you're seeing in terms of aew breaking down forbidden doors and and working with uh other and legitimizing in a way uh on local uh, uh content distribution other uh major alliances is next level thinking OK, and fr frankly speaking, as a fan, uh, it's awesome. I love seeing that. I'd love to see more of that. It's like, uh, why not? It's great for the business, right? Mm -hmm. um, it only makes sense 
that one extension of that would be in consumer products. It would not at all surprise me uh, if that happened, um, but I can't confirm it. And I only can speak about it in that kind of manner. That's fair. That's fair. Are you, are you aware of the, the market for custom Will Ospreay figures right now? Uh, I, I am aware of, of customizers and the amazing work they do. And I've seen people pay hundreds of dollars for a great custom. Yeah. Um, I can only imagine that that's probably following the pattern. Yeah. I just, I bring that up because I've seen, there's this guy out there who's putting out like, I mean, there's, these things are selling for like four to 500 bucks right now and he's cranking them out. And I'm just like, if you has would just make their own, they could they'd just be theirs. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> well, you know what? Look, I, I will tell you that, that uh, I'd love to do that. Um, I would not be at all surprised if we can figure out a way to make that happen. Awesome. Well, the last question I have along those lines is about the Supremes. Um, can, do, can we still expect like CM Punk Supreme, Young Buck Supremes and yeah. like kind of in a timeline on those if possible? Yeah, you can absolutely expect that. And um, we should be cranking those out, you know, especially with e-commerce, especially with the relationships that we have with people like Ringside way more often. So maybe cool. four to six styles a year or more. They're, in my opinion, they're the best figures on the market. They're, they're so Thank pretty, you. So they're, yeah, Thank incredible. You. incredible. At the Ray Phoenix right now. Thank you very yes. much. How, how, and I guess one more follow up to that. How, how do you how do you determine what's going to be like a ringside like exclusive versus just like a regular release? So I've so I've known Jonathan for 20 plus years. OK, so Jonathan Pankowski at ringside and uh, he's you know, obviously created a beautiful business and we go back all the way to the earliest days. Okay. He was a kid. Uh, he was, uh, in college and, uh, back way back in the day, I basically told him, I was like, look, if you are willing to dedicate that, if you're willing to turn this into your career post-college, I'm willing to dedicate exclusives to you. This was back in this classic superstars earliest days. And he certainly put his money where his mouth was and they bought um, they bought the message boards, the, uh, the, uh, oh God, what is it? Uh, wrestling figs, message boards and, and all that dude, he crushed it. It was brilliant. So cut to 20 years later and, um, and now we're doing AEW, um, because there's such a close relationship, essentially the way it works is we just go to them and say, look, tell us the top eight things that you're looking for. And if they're not otherwise part of our line, um, you know, and sometimes when they even are part of our line, we'll do the right thing from a partnership standpoint and we'll reallocate certain things to give them a great uh, lineup because we want a healthy ringside collectibles. A uh, healthy ringside collectibles is great for for everybody and and it's great for the wrestling figure game in general because n nobody's been more consistent than those guys from a retail standpoint uh with wrestling figures for this period of time. They've been awesome. I don't know uh, if this, I, I believe it's a ringside collectibles exclusive, but the dog collar with, with CM Punk and MJF, yeah, this yeah. is, yes. Well, so, so that's a, that's a big one. And on, on the point of that is AW still a relatively new company. Like this is their yeah. fourth year going into it. And so they don't have like a the ton of memorable moments that like a WWE or so or someone has, but they, they're starting to create those memorable moments. And I don't know yeah. if this is like a, a ringside collectibles call or your call of like what memorable moment, memorable match, memorable face gear is like, hey, let's turn this into a figure. And so I guess two parts on this is like, is that your call, their call? And then second part is like, is there something that stands out to you of like, oh, that's a good figure? right there that's something we want to do down the line yeah yeah i mean generally speaking uh you know we try not to be dictators okay so we'll we'll establish what we think is the best line and then we'll have a two-way conversation with both aew uh from a license or standpoint because ultimately they have to approve the stuff that we do they have to look at the sculpts and the deco and they have to look at the lineup and everything else um but also with um with a retailer like ringside you know we it's a, as far as we're concerned you know some manufacturers see everything as a one-way thing not for us it's two-way it is a two-way street especially when people have so much data and information um and and that's really the way it works like with a with a ringside collectibles we'll sit down we'll say here's here's what we have coming out um here's a few ideas for things that we can do with you what do you got 
and we'll sit down and negotiate it. We'll hash it out like a, you know, like like you might do uh, in any scenario that you're making stuff for somebody. But um, in terms of what makes a great moment, you know, it what great what makes a great moment in the moment is often very different from what makes a great moment moment in retrospect and the way something is kind of marinates over the years. Like I can't even imagine that. Um, oh gosh. Now, you know, this is a function of being uh, almost 50 <laughs> years old, but, but when we did the classic superstars uh, character of the guy that fell through the screen uh, back in the day on, uh, thank you. Yeah. I don't uh, listen. Yeah. <laughs> The fact that I'm blanking on Shockmaster is pathetic, and it means I'm probably only doing this for a few more years. But yes, dude, so Shockmaster, I'm going to tell you, there weren't 17 people on Earth that would have bought a Shockmaster figure 10 minutes after that right. uh, uh, broadcast. Not 17, maybe not 10, maybe not three. Okay, but by the time we're doing Classic Superstars 15 years later, uh, that was one of the moments. That was like a meme moment where people were like, Oh yeah, we want it. So it is amazing what happens over time and the terms. Yeah. Some things are obvious. Some things are super obvious. You know, if, if you have a major championship match and there's blood and there's a, a, a championship change and there's a moment of iconic moment where one person is victorious and the others lo- like, it's easy. It's easy. But when someone runs towards the ring and, slips and falls under the ring and <laughs> yeah last through a stage or, like these things tend to get better and better and better over time after percolating a bit well that's something that you know another thing i want to give you all <clears throat> give you all credit for is the blood and guts line that jeremy's referring to that's another just i, I like just i love that that exists in the right. figure space there's something totally different that you know for like the older collectors and even for the kids like they'd want to reenact that match like it, what better way? I used to color all over my figures. I'd take red marker and color all over them because you know, they didn't have blood on them. You know what I mean? So, like, now you got the real deal. Dude, I um, did too. I did too, yeah. except I wasn't using uh, LJNs. I was using uh, G.I. Joes and renaming them as wrestling figures and my Star Wars figures, um, which is, uh, you know, which is what you had to do before you had proper wrestling mm-hmm. figures. Yeah, absolutely. Something else I wanted to give you all credit for that I wanted your, your mindset on here is the, the idea – which I know that people really appreciate is the way that you've made these figures to where you can like pop the torsos and everything off so easily to like customize your own yeah. figures. Um, I guess, can you speak at all to that? Or is that just kind of the mindset is like collectors are going to want to do this. Let's make it easy for them. So they don't have to do it all these steps to like, if they're going to pop the heads off these things and the arms and shoulders and stuff, like let's, let's just make it easy for them. Yeah. I think, I think that part of it is that part of it is from a QC standpoint, Sometimes when you do that, it makes something safer. Sometimes it makes something uh, harder to actually break um, when there's when it breaks away. It's a good point. Uh, but the other benefit of it is certainly something that was in our mind that resonates. We we do want people to be able to do what they do once. Like, look, once a figure is in your possession, and I used to I used to like I was shocked that Mark Matt Cardona would do this, but like he bought all the classic superstars and then let them breathe, right? Busted them all out of package, which I thought was crazy as hell. He spent probably $20,000 breaking figures out of package, but you know what? It made for great content. And uh, it was, uh, it was a great moment. And and, like that, that's the way I look at it. If you want to break them apart, mix and match, customize, bloody blow up, whatever it is, it's your, figure federation it's your fantasy land and world it's your content go go do what you're gonna do yes one one line where i don't know if you could do that um is the the bone crunchers and uh, nowadays like is there any possibility of doing like an aew bone cruncher line sure Absolutely. Maybe we'll start on it like right after this call. It's such a good idea. Ooh, yeah, wow, I love that'd, be, that'd be so cool. <laughs> so back in the day, I'm, I'm, you know, been doing this a long time, right? So we did a lot of things also that didn't work. Like I don't know if you guys remember face flipping fighters. Remember yes. those? Yes. I remember like the Power Rangers that would do the head flip, but I don't think that's something different than what you're well, talking about. The the fact of the matter is, three percent of the people that listen to this 
will actually remember face flipping fighters. But there were two things that we tried that were kids oriented at the same time that we were trying the classic superstars to appeal to adults. Um, the adult one worked and, and the rest is history. The wrestling figure business is primarily a collector business today. The kids business didn't do so well. One was face flipping fighters, which was basically you push the legs together and there'd be a flip from like a happy face to a really pissed off face uh, that may be super red. And like, so anyways, there's a lot of things that you can kind of like <laughs> deduct from those types of things, but I don't want to get into it. And then the other was something called pump and flex. Now pump and flex was the biggest POS of all time. Okay. And I don't mean like point of sale. I mean the dirty part, dude, it was, you would, you would squeeze it and the, the chest would come out into this rubbery substance, making it look like you've like totally flexed out, right? <laughs> and the problem is the rubber after about 12 months would start to disintegrate. And so even at retail, you'd like have pump and flex looking like a saran wrap on a, on a piece of chicken. Uh, and so what I'm basically saying to you guys is it hasn't all been – peachy we've made plenty of mistakes over the years but all in all like when you get it right you focus on what you get right you use that thread and you run it and when you get it wrong you go to retail you pay them what they need to get paid to get that stuff off the shelf so that you can open it up to sell some good stuff and that's generally the way it works but um i think my favorite sort of unheralded figure assortment of all time and i'm trying to remember what it was called whether it was un was it was called unlimited but it was like an end. It was like a. I don't remember if it was unlimited. Again, I've done so many lines over the years, but that's one to look up as well. That that worked okay. It wasn't like a slam dunk, but it was a lot of fun. Well, a line that I think is going to be a slam dunk is when y'all start putting out those Ring of Honor figures that y'all been teasing. That's yes. very exciting. Um, has, has the feedback been, I mean, it has to have been like overly, uh, overwhelmingly positive, I'd imagine. Cause these are, these are figures for these are talk about moments and characters and figures and stuff that we never thought we would get for the last 20 years. Listen, I am so psyched about ring of honor and, uh, AEW psyched about ring of honor and our team psyched about ring of honor. We're going to do a, uh, phenomenal job with that. And, um, you know, the extensions there are interesting because you talked about, the idea of doing, you know, authentic legends and, you know, AEW's relatively new organization. So like we did the Owen Hart, which was awesome because it was bringing somebody back after 20 years, but 25, but you couldn't do it as authentic as because, you know, the original gear may be associated with another um, association. Uh, but if you do some of the classic ring of honor stuff, that's a whole different story. So it really opens the door for us to do some really cool, not just present day Ring of Honor product, but historical and bringing back characters that, you know, in a very authentic way. Yeah, that that I'm first really... Brian Danielson Ring of Honor yeah. uh, figure is I'm sure you're going to sell very well. And is definitely one that I will have my eye our design team rocks. Uh, <laughs> they really do. Yeah, absolutely. How, how do you know, by the way, that like, I'm sure there's like skews and metrics and stuff involved in this, but like, how do you know, like for sure if a figure is doing well, so, you know, like I want to make more of like this person or we maybe shouldn't make as many of these because they didn't do as well. Like how, how do you kind of judge that? Well, there's, there's several ways. Um, you know, one is instinctively, you kind of have a sense as who's on the top of the roster um, and who's in the middle of the roster and who's on neither. And if you're, if you're managing it right, you can go deeper into the roster by affecting the amount of product that's going out. So if you have an assortment uh, of six pieces in a master carton, maybe um, a C level character shows up once every two or three boxes. So one of every 18 figures, whereas an A level character might be two per box. So there's ways that you can game it going in uh, to shipping. Um, but ultimately you know, you never know for sure. And, and tastes vary over time and excitement varies over time. So what I like to do is I like to undership in general. And I know it's very annoying, but I will tell you this, it's better to have a shelf that is empty sometimes 
than it is to have a shelf that has the same figures on it for a year. Right. That's the worst for a collector, the worst. Uh, so anyways, uh, number one, you can game it. Number two, you can gauge it because you can see the point of sale information. And, you know, every one of these action figures has like a mother number on the box. So you can see it either on the UPC code or otherwise. And but a lot of them also have baby numbers where you have individual numbers for each character. So when beep they go across the sales, uh, you can see the data. So I can see, oh, wow, Darby's selling a ton of figures and Schmarby is not. And so right. less Schmarby's and more Darby's. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's good that there's all those trackers and metrics now, because I'm sure you've heard the stories back in the day. You buy these, you buy probably any of these WCW figures behind me. They probably rang up as Hulk Hogan back then. So. <laughs> oh, I can tell you why, by the way. Yeah, yeah if you'd like to explain. <laughs> yes, please so, do. <laughs> so, and all right. So this is not about those WCW figures or any figures in general. I'm not casting any sort of negative spell here. But I can tell you that one thing that, bad actors can do and there's nobody that i know of today that uses this but back in the day i knew some folks that would occasionally is if you had s excess stock okay and it's and and you know your characters are tied to a particular number right but if you had excess stock yeah just shove the stock into a box where that said hulk hogan from a mother number even though it said another name on the box itself and you're able to sell some additional product in the marketplace. It's mm. horrible. It's a horrible practice. But if you've ever seen that sort of thing, that's one potential explanation as to why. That's very interesting. Yeah. Wow. This is fascinating. I, yeah. I do want to, I, I want to follow up on, you mentioned on Jensen asking like, who do you kind of decide to, to sell and things like that? Yeah. So very famously, uh, Cody Rhodes had about 18 figures come out <laughs> and, and Britt Baker had zero figures come out and she made it no secret that she was displeased with how many figures Cody was getting compared to her. How much of that was reality and how much of that was her playing kind of just into the online persona here? Uh, well, for the basis of this, I'll say it was 100% reality. <laughs> uh, was she calling you every night of like, why is Cody getting another figure? What are we doing you know here? Let's put it this way. Early on, especially when you launch any action figure line, you really you have to be very careful. You have to be very, very, very careful. And, um, you know, I, I really believe that especially in, during the six, first six months, we we undershipped pretty significantly because we didn't want retail to choke on product and then to turn on us very quickly, which they will do. I mean, they you can be off the shelf in two seconds. Um, so we, we, uh, if, if I had it to do over again, I'd have had Brett in, you know, wave one, but the, the truth of the matter is that's, that's not the path we took. And we, we waited too long. It, I wish we'd have had her out before. Um, playfully, she wanted to kill me. Um, <laughs> in reality, maybe she wanted to kill me. And in fantasy, she definitively wanted to kill me. Uh, but she wasn't the only one. And I've all I've been on the hit list of many, many uh, very strong, very athletic people over the years. And uh, I will uh, always be on their hit list. And that, I'm OK with that. Now, speaking of the those early run AEW figures, you know, my honestly, probably my favorite there. You can, it's hard to see with my camera, but I've got I've got all of series one version one signed behind me here. And that's nice. like one of my favorite. It's like they're kind of the centerpiece of really my collection, honestly. Like I, I love love that first line i'm a i'm a cody Rhodes mark so like anything cody i'm i'm all about and speaking of and this is another question i don't know how much you want to talk about this i don't know how much there's honest like i really don't know but like my my grail figure is that first series cody Rhodes with like the star trek style shirt and everything that's like become super super valuable yeah. pretty much impossible. but there was yeah, a very I, I short gave time mine away i gave mine oh, away that oh. that Yes, oh. I, I I was trying to get some Twitter followers or something. Uh, oh it was so goodness. stupid. I was like, you know what? What is it selling for now? Thousands of dollars. Uh, thousands, yeah. Thousands. Okay, great, great. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and to tie into that, there was a short time where they were being sold for $100. I believe it was High Spots. We're selling them for $100. And it was like a really short time thing. I couldn't afford it at the time. And it was like this really crazy thing because it was like the only time I've really seen anything like that happen where it's like, 
I know that obviously shop AEW does theirs. I buy all those. That's super easy. Just, you know, when they're coming out you go on, you buy them. But there was this like this one day where like these Cody Rhodes, the rare Cody Rhodes popped up online for a hundred bucks. And I was like, I was so confused by it. And I really, I'm kicking myself that I didn't buy five of them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So did you, do you know, do you know what I'm talking about? I don't, but I can, I, I can explain it. I think. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes when you make super limited edition product, you ex- the way you describe it to the factory in terms of the way it's distributed is like this. OK, I'm going to I'm going to use some arbitrary numbers. OK, but you say to the factory, OK, wave one, we're making 50,000 figures. OK, of those 50,000 figures, we're making 500 figures that are these very special limited edition figures. I don't want all 500 to show up in the same shipper right. where one store blasts them out and they find a bazillion of them. But what, here, what I do want you to do is for every hundred figure that you ship out until you get rid of all 500 figures. So a hundred times 500 is 50,000. Okay. So for every hundred, I'm going to ship out one of these special Cody Rhodes figures. Okay. And then what happens is in a perfect world, after 50,000 figures have shipped out, boop, 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 99, 100, bam, the Cody. 199, 200, bam, the Cody. 299, 300, bam, the Cody. Ideally, 49,999, 50,000, boom, Cody. All right. In reality, what happens is 99, 100, Cody. 199, 200, Cody. <sighs> All right. I'm going to put, I'm just going to do one box. I, I'm exhausted. I'm going to do one box of Cody's. I, that's my best guess is that occasionally I'm and, or it could be more less like that and more like, okay, we've shipped out all the figures. We still have seven Cody's sitting here. What do we do with this? There's an order for the first wave to ship that. And somebody just gets really, really lucky. It's either yeah. a situation where you've really given some very detailed instructions and someone decides in the middle of the night in a country, 6,000 miles away to deviate from those instructions or it's a scenario where you have some stuff that's left over and they box it up and ship it out and someone gets really lucky. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. It, Cause just in my own experience, kind of like paying attention to the scene as stuff pops up, I'm in a bunch of like the Facebook bigger groups and, and all that stuff. And like, um, it seems like they kind of goes in waves. Like you'll see like a lot of people all at once be like, I found a chase. I found a chase. I found a chase. And then like, it'll, you won't see that for a minute. And but it's all, it's almost like it goes in like cycles and waves almost, but, yeah, but that's and, very fair. And I think that that has a lot to do with what I'm saying. Right. Best laid plans, uh, really basically turning into something where somebody is making it a little bit easier on themselves and just kind of shipping it out as a box with a bunch of stuff in it. Cool. Got it. Uh, my my last question. You've been very very generous with your yes. your, your time of tonight. Course. You, you guys are too awesome. much longer. Uh, I'm, honored is, be, I'm honored to be here, guys. Honest, I mean, like anytime. So, oh, Thank we you. we really we really appreciate. It. I know Jensen specifically can probably just ask you a million million more questions. Yeah, I got, I got I got I got like one or two more. That's it. Like, <laughs> no problem. No problem. Yeah, yeah. Cool. My my <laughs> last question on on the wrestling side of things is: Is there a figure that? is almost a white whale of like, I've never done this one. And this is what I always wanted to do. Yeah. Owen, Owen was at the top of that. Okay. Because in the classic superstars assortment, I talked to his wife for, you know, 10 years and we just couldn't get there. Um, it just, you know, it was, it was, it was really hard for very clear reasons. And there was a lot of respect. Martha, you know, is a phenomenal individual, um, top notch, uh, we just couldn't we couldn't get there. So the fact that we got there with AEW was had a lot to do with Chris Jericho and Tony Khan and and uh, Martha. Uh, and um, interestingly enough, also um, uh, my my good buddy from uh, Dark Side of the Ring, uh, Evan. Uh, there were there were a lot of players that came together that um, that made something like that possible, where we were connecting the dots. Um, so that fell at the very top of the food chain. You know, for me at one point in time, doing a Jerry Lawler uh, uh, two pack um, with um, um, the comedian uh, Andy, Kaufman. Andy Kaufman. Kaufman. Yeah. Yeah. That was another grail for me. And that we did that with classic superstars. 
Uh, Ric Flair was my favorite growing up. That was another grail for me. So some of the grails we were able to do, you know, some we weren't. Uh, I personally, and I'm going to put over another company and, you know, that's fine because I've done this a long time, but I, I love that Mattel is doing the Muhammad Ali figure that I, I love it. I actually yeah. I have to say I have a ton of respect for that move. That's a, that was a solid move. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think that there's just, there's certainly some, some, uh, opportunities out there, but, but Owen was a big one for me. I'd love to do Owen in some real authentic gear. That would be cool. Um, that actually ties in with the next question I had, which is how did you link up with Logan Paul in the Pokemon <laughs> world? And also, what do you think about his figure? Cause I have it here. It's, it's, I think it's an incredible, they did a great job with yeah, this thing. Great job. I mean, it's no, uh, you know, it's, it's no, no, it's, it's no Supreme. I know, no, 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 we're not, we're not getting crazy. I mean, listen, WWE fan creation ultimates like that. Those are cool, but they're no Supreme. I'm, I'm, with you. I'm just, I'm with you. I'm just, I can't say too many nice things about Mattel in, in one sitting. Okay. I, I want to want, a, want a show. That's it. Um, um, yeah. So Logan, Logan reached out to me, um, uh, during COVID early during COVID, uh, I was being a very vocal Pokemon collector. And what had happened was, you know, originally when we sold Wicked Cool Toys, you know, we sold a lot of it and I retained equity in the in the larger organization uh, as well and stuck around. But one thing that I wanted to show and demonstrate to Pokemon was that I'm in this for the long haul. I, I don't sell and run away. Um, I, I, I that was never my objective. I mean, I don't get me wrong. I like money. It's great. It allows you to do things that you never expected to be able to do. And uh, like I said, you know, I didn't have a college fund. I didn't have a lot of stuff. So uh, I was pretty much happy, um, but I'm glad, but I didn't want to run away. So I made it a, a, and I very publicly said over the next, you know, year, I'm going to spend a million dollars on collectibles, on collectibles that I love uh, and kind of fulfilling a childhood dream that I was certainly never, ever, able to do anything like that before so one of the things that i focused on was pokemon um and i bought some amazing vintage pokemon product before everything blew up in a positive way and uh so it turned out to be a good investment too but along that path uh logan paul sent me a text and he was like hey i love what you're doing um let's talk and we got to know each other and we had a lot of uh shared objectives when it came to our collecting um and then one day he sends me another note and he's like, hey, what is the what is the grail? What is a single grail? The single number one. What is the Honus Wagner PSA 8? What is the 1952 Mickey Mantle PSA 10 tops pop three? What is the, you know, 1982 Hulk Hogan PSA 10 doesn't exist, by the way, wrestling all stars. What is that mm. item? What is that item? And I said, well. I said, there is a population of one, uh, 1997, 1998, Pikachu Illustrator. Uh, it is uh, PSA 10. I said, it is the grail. Uh, there is no other grail quite like that. And uh, we talked about it for about six months off and on. And I happened to know the, the very private person uh, that uh, owned it um, in Dubai. And that person in Dubai, uh, you know, I think everyone assumed that he was, you know, maybe a sheik, uh, like of untold remarkable fortunes. And I will not deny or confirm. <laughs> I will say he's an awesome guy, like a really cool down to earth everyday person, whatever his background is. And um, I, uh, I reached out to the guy. And I, the first thing I said was like, I make Pokemon stuff. I don't want any part of this deal. I don't want a commission. I don't want a damn thing. I just want to be part of history. That's all I want. I want to be around it. It makes me so excited. It's everything I ever wanted to be. Let me be a part of this. And I made that clear because, again, it goes completely against my objective of showing that I'm not opportunistic. I am a collector yes okay stuff will go up in value and one day when i retire and i'm no longer part of the pokemon universe i'll sell stuff 
because I don't want to anchor my kids with stuff that they don't understand. <laughs> but I'm not trying to do that right now. And so uh, Logan uh, and I talked about it. I reached out to the guy. The guy came back to me um, and essentially said, you know, he would do a deal for six million dollars. And it was kind of as a very large sum of money. OK, now that that sum of money, though, is not out of bounds with the highest end of card collecting. A couple of the cards that I mentioned before, a PSA 8 Honus Wagner, uh, the original Honus Wagner, the PSA 10 Mickey Mantle, um, those are $40 million cards now. OK, now I'm, I'm going to draw a, a parallel on those cards. Those are $40 million cards. That's a guarantee. Like if they said they would sell it for 30, I would put together a fund and I would contribute a large part of that fund to buy it at 30. That's how I know it's worth 40 because right. I would contribute to a fund at 30. OK. All right. So enough of that. I'm proving <laughs> a point. So six million dollars is a lot of money. OK. It's more money than I would have ever expected to see in my lifetime. That's for sure. And uh, so you got to respect it. And I, I went to Logan. And I said, look, I said, it's a ton of money. And he's like, whew, whew, takes a deep breath. He's like, okay. He goes, I want it. I want it so bad. And he said, is there any way I could trade a PSA 9 illustrator? Because there are a few of those. Uh, and give him money. And I went back and essentially a series of conversations. And uh, the guy said, yeah, you know what? I'll take $4 million and a PSA 9 illustrator. Talk to Logan. Anyways, we go through this whole thing. About six weeks later, I get a call out of the blue. Get on FaceTime. Get on FaceTime from Logan. I get on FaceTime. And he's smiling and he's holding a PSA 9 Illustrator. <laughs> and I go, no effing way. No way. You're doing it. This is insane. And uh, so I, I then link the two of those guys together. And I exited fully expecting that that was about as close to this as I was going to get. And I go to dinner and I get a text from Logan and he basically says, hey, man, he goes, I want you to come to Dubai with me. And I said, I, you know, this has been a year and a half ago or two years ago. I said, I don't think that you really want a 47 year old man in your content. I said, I don't think I'm good for your content. And he goes, no, you don't understand. He said, you're a big part of the story. He goes, I want you there with me, please. And I was like, all right, I'm coming. So I booked my ticket. I booked a first class ticket with my own money. I booked the Burj, you know, the, the one of the best hotels, period. Uh, I blew about 20 grand and uh, and it was the best 20 grand I've ever spent, to be honest with you. I loved it. I stayed out all night for three nights in a row. And by the way, they were like, you can really hang. And you know what the truth of the matter is? I just never acclimated to the new time. So there was no hanging. It wasn't about hanging. It was just simply a guy that's old that never could never reconfigure myself. I got home, my wife's like, dude, you're like, you're like on the time zone. I'm like, yeah, I stayed up all night every night. It was the best. <laughs> night oh my gosh, that's, that's, such an amazing... that's a long story. That's a long story, but that's that's essentially how it came together. For that. That's that's amazing. Now, one one other question I had about Matt and Logan and his figure. Now. I don't think it's something that's possible, but I feel like you're the only person in the world I can even ask about this. I would take this question seriously. Now, you have the IP to Pokemon. Yes. They cannot use the Pokemon Illustrator in Logan's figure. He has a blank space where his card would be. Yes. Could you theoretically make unrelated, really small Pokemon cards that you could potentially hypothetically put into one of those? <laughs> <laughs> now that that is very clever okay because then you'd get an authentic card to go with an authentic figure yeah um so here's the thing so pokemon pokemon is incredibly uh long uh they they make decisions based on a long-term decision sure okay and um as their toy maker we kind of know our place in the world. Okay. We make plush things and plastic things. We make role play things, but we do not make cards. Right. Because that is their domain. And I would never in a million years even approach them with it <laughs> because I never want them to think of us or me uh, as encroaching upon 
their primary business. And that's right. just, the, that is, that is a absolute truthful, straightforward answer. Uh, yeah. It sounds really cool. And if I could just sort of wave a magic wand, uh, <laughs> there'd, be, there'd be kind of things like that happening. But, but you know what, you got to respect, uh, first of all, Pokemon saved my career. Um, you know, we, we had, we had created a new business and, and, you know, like I said, you need a break and then you need to have a bigger break. Well, you know, my break was Pokemon coming to me and saying, you know, we love the way you manage the business. And, you know, you guys are very small, this company that you created six years ago, but we actually think that you can launch us, relaunch us globally. And it was right before Pokemon go. Uh, and uh, that was a miracle. Uh, and that had a lot to do with, you know, they say, okay, karma, right? So everyone's like, is karma real? Maybe karma's real. Maybe it's not real. I'll tell you how karma's real. Karma's real for sure in that we all have memories. We all have memories about the way we work together and how we, we deal with one another. And some things go in the bad bank of memories and some things go in the good bank of memories. I banked a lot of good memories with those folks. A lot. A lot of respectful, good, ethical memories. So it all came back later on in this opportunity. That was the break. And that just blew up everything in a positive way for me. So I will never do a thing. If, if someone told me tomorrow I had to spend 100% of my money to protect the relationship with Pokemon, I'd probably do it because it means that for me, I'd have purpose and I would uh, have longevity getting to work with them more. That's how much I, I care about that. Of course, the second big break was everything that happened afterwards with the sale and then uh, and then Squishmallows. And then the one thing we haven't touched on is that last October, uh, we have a new sheriff in town. Warren Buffett bought our company. Right. So Berkshire Hathaway came in. And how about that for a remarkable, outrageous turn of events? So I've talked to your ear off. Uh, I hope that's okay. <laughs> Dude, absolutely. Yeah, this is like, yes, I love this. I mean, I, I, I got a couple more than these are going to be fast answers. You can even get everyone on these. <laughs> Go for it. This is unrelated to anything else we've even talked about, but I'm, I'm a fan of yours. So I know weird things. Would you put, <laughs> would you, would you, would you put, would you put any, is there even a number that you could put on your Michael Jordan, LeBron James error card? Oh man. All right. So here's, here's the number. You ready for the number? Yeah. The number is don't buy stuff with other people. <laughs> That's the number. Because when you buy stuff with other people, no matter what it is that you want to do, you are only part of a group. And so, yes, there was a number. And and the number that we got was one twentieth of the number that I think it should be worth. Did you sell it? Sold it. Oh, I didn't know you sold it. Okay, I didn't even yeah. know you sold it. Okay. Yes. If it were just my card, uh, no, the number would have been uh, impossibly high. Okay. I was just in I, I did not know that you sold that card. Uh, Jeremy, just so you know, he, right. Jerry Pedauer had this. It was a it was a error card where the front of it yeah. was LeBron James's rookie card with a yeah. Michael Jordan back on it and Michael Jordan's name on the front. It was like the most bizarre error card ever, probably. Impossible card. And and my buddies at Upper Deck, when I showed it to them, they were like, this is crazy. This, I mean, it's real. It's bizarre. The best thing that we could potentially come up with is it was a test run and that someone just palmed it at some point and it's kind of found its way into the universe. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it, sometimes things can be so rare that it's hard to establish a value to the level that you would think that something might be worth. And that's kind of like a situation like that. There was nothing that you could possibly compare it to. Sure. I'll say that. I, I'm looking up uh, just, just a photo. I don't know if this is the real thing or anything, but I don't know if I'd ever let that go. That seems like. No, trust me. You, you <laughs> have the two greatest basketball players of all time. Like, Both number on 23. That was probably part of it, too. I know, like but here's the thing. If you buy something with two buddies, right? okay, and I have no problem with with those guys. I, I love those guys. But if you buy something with two buddies and two people say they want to sell something, you sell it. That's just the way it works. Uh, if you buy it with one buddy and you're stronger than them, <laughs> are these people fair, still fair. your friends jeremy this, this yeah, is 100 percent. Would... <laughs> okay. no no friendship is worth uh at this point in my life maybe at one point i would have 
you know, would, I would have had a sore spot. There's no friendship that's worth an amount of money for me. None. Sure. Nice. That's oh, fair. that's very heartwarming. This, this is absolutely my last question for you. Let's All right. go. All right, here we go. <laughs> this is once again completely unrelated and this is because once again you're very forward thinking you collect everything you you're, you're you're thinking in the future with all this stuff right just yes. just just shoot it to me straight just give me a real answer here during the pandemic did i waste my money on dave and buster's nfts <laughs> <laughs> oh man so i'm so look i don't want to <laughs> discourage anybody but I, but here, here's what i will say about nfts okay i'm gonna i'm gonna take i'm gonna t- listen you know the answer to that question I do, yeah they're valueless <laughs> in fact in fact yes they, they probably <laughs> okay and if, okay so here's the thing here's the thing about collectibles in general okay when you have and i'm looking for a trading card oh you know what this kid made me a Made well, me look, a, yeah, that thing exists, right? Like, okay, so th- yeah. this is not real. Some a, a kid made this for me. It was very sweet. Okay, oh, that's it's awesome. A, it's very a cool. it's a 2001 Jeremy and Pikachu first edition. <laughs> oh, okay, that's awesome. So uh, this is one of the greatest things. So I keep it in my office. Okay, so now let me just say this. Okay, in defense of the concept of invisible objects having value. Okay, sure. Um, this for let's just say for a moment that this is worth a million dollars. Okay. Now, there have been pieces of paper that are worth a million dollars. In fact, I demonstrated one that sold for five, and I've communicated to you that there are some that sell for forty million dollars right. for real, no doubt about it. I know it would. Okay, in our imagination, this is one that would sell for a million, but the physical paper here may be worth three cents, it may be worth a penny, and now it's got writing on it. No one could ever use it again. So what is the real intrinsic value of this little piece of paper? It's very low. Right. On the other hand, you have this invisible thing that has no intrinsic value whatsoever. So really, this you accept is worth millions of dollars. And this seems like it would be worth nothing because you can't see it. So yeah. I have mixed emotions about NFTs. The problem with NFTs were, was not in the underlying concept of value. The problem in NFTs were the number of rug pulls and fakers and bad actors and really, really poor, poor, ethical, bad things that, that happened yeah, with NFTs. Fair. Yeah, they were just... The, the beauty behind physical cards associated with licenses is that there's a gatekeeper, the licensor, and this gatekeeper will make damn sure that year after year, whatever the card is, whether it's Magic or Pokemon or Topps Baseball or whatever it else it is, has a system of collectability that will stand the test of time. It's like a social contract between the manufacturer and the consumer. And, and we feel like we have a social contract as well when we're making our action figures, right? Sure. There was a lack of social contract when it came to a lot of the NFTs and there were no controls. So yes, Board Ape came out, and and Crypto Punks came out, and there was some rarity to it, and it was very cool and unusual. And yes, being a part of the club actually came with some benefits, and maybe you could get to go to a party, etc. And that was okay for a moment, but then six months later, there were a thousand of these clubs, and then six months later, there were a million of these clubs, and there were a lot. There was so much bad behavior, and it all imploded. My take on it is there will be a day where these invisible objects have some value recreated in a whole different way. And with long-term protections, um, I have a lot of thoughts about it. I have a lot of thoughts in terms of the way you could even establish a business around it. But right now, 99.8% of the stuff in the marketplace is complete trash worth nothing. uh, And they've earned it. Bad, bad actors. I'm not saying Dave and Buster's falls into that category. No, understood. No, no, we're not, no, Dave and Buster's <laughs> standing here on this show. Uh, but, no, but, Come on, I, but I am saying that that is, that's just the reality of it. There's yeah, um, of that was by far, hands down, the most logical explanation of NFTs I've heard anybody explain. Like, I mean, so I'm glad that you. Thank you for bringing all that up. And hey, listen, the way you explained it too, maybe like 20, 30 years into the future, I do not without even knowing it, I do kind of sort of 
own part of Dave and Buster's, you know? So like maybe, you know, maybe, yeah. these, you know, sometimes the best thing to do with some of these, some of this crypto is like, just forget your password and come back to it for a few years later. Just see where it's at. <laughs> yes, exactly. you know I mean? I'm, I'm going to tell you a business plan. <laughs> And maybe somebody on this, here's a free business plan for somebody. Maybe somebody on this will make it work. And I hope you do. In fact, I hope that, you know, I, I, everybody I meet, I hope is, does something that, that fulfills them and gives them purpose and gives them a great life. Um, but w- the thing that's missing in the NFT universe is that when you invest in something, um, you want to have a return, some sort of return. So if you invest in a stock, you're investing in a stock because you want the company to be profitable and that they divvy up that profit in 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 distributions or they retain those earnings and they become more and more valuable as an organization um alternatively you want to buy an experience you want something to happen you want to be a part of a club where only you and your other holders can experience something real my belief is if you created a community where the idea was there's profit sharing Meaning that whenever these things sell, everybody in the community also shares in the profits of these things. And so if they go up in value, you share in the profits, just like in a traditional business. And 90% of the value that's coming in to the creators is distributed back to the people with experiences. If you can do both of those things and make it very people-centric, then you have something that I think actually will have value and really interesting. Other than that, there's so much crap. It's just complete dog. Poop. Yeah, you can curse. You can no, curse. <laughs> it seems literally, uh, literally, literally called shit coins that people invest in. I mean, like it is what it is. <laughs> I mean, yeah. so um, yeah, Jeremy. I don't know if you want to last the one we always ask. I mean, it's a tough one. Oh, we have to. Not like Jeremy. I mean, this is so, go go do shoot for it. Uh, okay, so we ask, we ask everybody this, and you've already shown us uh, some some very awesome collectibles. But we ask everybody the coolest thing you have in your room. <laughs> Oh well, so so the coolest thing, so the coolest things I have are in a vault, okay, and and that's, that's just, a flex. Like, that's a huge flex right there. No, no, it's not. It's self preservation, just in case anybody wants to check out where I live. But the coolest thing I have are in a vault. That's just the truth. And and for me, probably one of my coolest things is a first edition, first print Harry Potter, one of five hundred, that is in pristine condition. It may be the best copy in the world. And uh, I when I bought it. I paid the most ever paid for a modern work. Um, and it was a couple hundred thousand dollars. And, uh, and, and look, I say that and keep in mind, I already disclosed to you that I said I was going to spend a million bucks because I was trying to show my, my partners how much I'm in this forever. But that Harry Potter book, like, look, 20 years ago, I remember reading those books with my wife, right? We, so I never read. I can barely read, to be honest. I sat there with my wife. I read all those books. Those books are incredible. So having the opportunity to buy the pristine copy, it may be a flex. It's also the truth. And it is 100% not in my house. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. That's fair. Well, you, That's again, fair. You've already shown us some very cool yes, things. Uh, absolutely. Just in, your, in your, I assume, office that, that you're in. Yeah, right I'm now. in my office right now. In fact, you can kind of see, you know. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Other stuff going uh, on over here. Very cool. Look at all that awesome stuff. Jeremy, well, thank you so yeah, much. We've taken way too much of your time, man. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for my sticking pleasure. around for so long with this us. This was a blast. And thanks for everything that you guys do. You guys have truly, again, you've, man, I got to tell you, as a kid growing up, if there was only, if there was only like media like you guys covering the fight game, covering all of it, it, it just, it just makes it better. You, you make things better. You, you extend the content. You extend the fantasy. You extend the 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 fun of it. And thank you for everything that you do. Yeah, I oh, thank you again. Thank that. you for yeah. for everything you thank do. You. I know when the AEW deal was announced, everybody was very excited about that, and now they are, are big hits. Uh, the Jensen again has the entire collection behind that. him there. And I'm I'm not the figure collector that I once was. I will say it's around here somewhere. I have the Orange Cassidy figure that is one of the best figures uh, I've ever gotten my hands on, especially because you can put his hands in his pocket, yep. which absolutely <laughs> rules. Uh, so yeah, that's when that is one figure I was like. I'm going out of my way. I got to get this Orange Cassidy figure. <laughs> when the Danielson ROH figure comes out, I'm, I'm snatching that thing immediately. As awesome. Well. So thank you again for, for everything you. that you do. Let everybody know where, where they can find you at, where they can support you at. 
Well, first of all, Jazzwares. So Jazzwares is the company and you can find us everywhere, everywhere you want to look at Jazzwares. And for me, um, Twitter, it's, I think it's at Jeremy Com. Instagram is at Jeremy Padauer, P-A-D-A-W-E-R. And I just, you know, sometimes I talk about collecting. Sometimes I talk about the stuff that we're making at Jazzwares. And sometimes I just lament or, or troll, <laughs> just, you know, what can I tell you? Jerry, thank you again so much. All the links are in the below in the description, by the way, on the video, folks. So everybody go can just click there, go to where you need to go, whether it's following Jeremy on uh, Instagram, Twitter, any other social, or checking out the Jazzwares websites and you know, supporting everything they do. Because it's not only wrestling, as we talked about a little bit. The Squishmallows, the Roblox, the Pokemon. I got to – the kids are going to bug me Coco to go Mellon. on this website. Coco, there you go. There you <laughs> go. Yeah, the kids are like, oh, get this, get this, get this. Like, all right, all right, calm down. Okay, thank you again, Jerry. Thank we really so appreciate much, it. Guys, we will be right back here on the Sports.